Nobody's here. <laughs> I am uh, here this morning. The Lord put it on my heart about 4.30 this morning to get up and be in the pulpit this morning. So that's where I am. Um, beautiful day. It's just lovely to look outside and, and see grass growing. And don't I love that first smell of grass when it's mowed? Isn't that a great thing? Ah, spring is here. And uh, it seems that we're going to hit 80 degrees by the end of this week. I hope that's true. Because I have to get my dock in the water. And the water is very cold. And I'm hoping that we get a few warm days between now and uh, Friday when my son can come and help. And uh, we'll go in. I only have to get about waist deep, but that's too deep when it's really, really cold. So um, that'll be nice. It, uh, that means once the dock's in, we'll be on spring. Summer's here. And I'm ready for that, too. Well, uh, as I said, the Lord put it on my heart this morning. I should be at the church on Sunday morning, sharing from his word to you folks. So that's where I am, and that's what I'm doing this morning. We're in 1 Samuel 24 this morning. Um, do want to mention, though, that as well, we have our prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and I certainly want to invite you to come out to that. That's at 6 o'clock on Wednesdays. And the Arise meeting on Friday at 7 o'clock. And our Arise meeting is its just open. Just come, you know, and especially if... If you're going through some difficulty right now, it's uh, it's good to be there. It's good to gather with, with some folks, and it's an opportunity to share some of the things you're going through. So I invite you to come here to this building and meet on Friday night. Um, also want to remind you every day, 1030, right here as well. We're going through the book of Jude right now on a snail's pace. But the Lord is ministering through his word, so uh, feel free to join us with that, too. And you can find all those videos as well, both on YouTube and here on Facebook Live. So it's in our uh, church page. So uh, make yourself available to those. Um, but let's pray, and let's get into Scripture this morning in 1 Samuel 24. Oh, Lord, we just thank you so much for all the great things you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And we thank you, Lord, for another day of life, another day to serve you. And that's our desire this day, Lord, to hear from you, to apply what we hear, and to go forward walking with you through this journey we call life. So, Lord, as we spend a few minutes in your word today, we ask you to speak to our hearts and bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, 1 Samuel 24 is where we are. Um, and let's just read the, uh, the first couple of verses. It says, Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of, rocks of wild goats. So, you know, last week we, we talked about how David was in deep, deep trouble. Saul was on one side of the mountain. He was on the other. Saul was encircling him. It was looking like uh, Saul was about to get David. And then word came... Um, the Philistines have attacked. And so Saul had to leave and go deal with the Philistines, which he did do. And now as we open here, we see that um, trouble has come back. You know, Saul, the first thing, as soon as he's done with the Philistines, as it says in verse 1, he's returned from following those guys. Then now it's time to go back and harass David. That is the forefront of his heart, just to see where David is so he can kill him for no reason, absolutely no reason. David's done nothing wrong. Shouldn't happen. But, you know, that's really how our enemy is. 
<laughs> the devil. Isn't that how he is? I mean, we get victory or, or we get it, we escape from whatever it is he's trying to torment us with. And we get away from him, but it's only for a season. He comes back. He doesn't leave us alone. It doesn't matter to him. He's, he comes back at us. But the good news is it won't always be like this, you know. There is that day coming when we'll be standing in the presence of the Lord. And on that day, we don't have to worry about that, that, that crafty old devil, you know. He isn't going to bother us anymore. He's going to be done. Um, now, in Getty, where David was, um, let me see what I wrote here. It says, there is a canyon that runs westward from the Dead Sea with waterfalls and vegetation that makes it like a paradise in the midst of the desert. So it's a nice place to hang out, nice place to go. If you got to be on the run, I mean, why not be in a beautiful place in the middle of a desert, but, you know, an oasis in the desert. And in this canyon, in this area, there's a lot of hills, a lot of caves. And these caves made for a good place to shelter the sheep, especially in the heat of the day. Some of them perhaps dug out a little extra just to make them a little bigger, but it was uh, a good resting place, uh, a perfect hiding place, it was a good place to hide because um, there were so many caves there, so many places to hide and yet be able to see if your enemy is coming, like David could see if Saul was coming with an army. So the reason David, as we're about to read, is in a cave is because he saw the threat coming. He sees Saul coming with these men. As it says in uh, verse 2, he had 3,000 chosen men, 3,000 good warriors. Well, David has 600. The odds aren't very good, you know, and that's the thing. When you see a battle coming and you know you're outnumbered, it's good to go hide from it. That's not a bad thing. Um, that's really the way it's been with this virus. You know, it's like that that enemy that's coming at us, and it looks like it's well equipped to overtake us and so we went and we hid we've done that we've separated and we needed to do that because it was wise to do that and so the three thousand men are coming david and his men they slip into caves i doubt all 600 were in one cave i'm sure they were spread out a little bit but verse three says so he uh meaning saul came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. So of all the caves that are there, <laughs> isn't it amazing that Saul chooses the one David's hiding in? That's just one of them coincidences. God had nothing to do with that, of course, you know. No, certainly, this is a, an event orchestrated by the Lord. Because David, wanting nothing to do with Saul, he's not gonna, in any way trying to hurt him, not in any way trying to damage him. But Saul certainly is seeking to kill David. But on the way, now, what does that mean? He went in to attend his needs, uh, some think he had to go to the bathroom, and that's very possible that is what it is. Another commentator said it's more likely that it was very hot. He's been marching through the desert. He just wanted to lay down for a few minutes and take a rest. It could be that as well. I don't know. Just meant he had some need that the cave made it a good place to go to take care of it. We'll leave it at that. So he did. He went in there. <clears throat> But the odds, you know, what are the odds of this happening? Seems like it's 100% because God's in the middle of this. You know, this is something God um, orchestrated. God created the events, the circumstances, and this situation to arrange things because he had a purpose in it, a purpose to show Saul some things and a reason to show David some things and a reason to show me some things and hopefully show you some things, you know. It's a test for David. It's to train him, though, and his men. And it'll also display David's godly heart. 
So imagine the excitement, though, of David's men. Think of that. Here you are in a cave, and your enemy, all alone, comes into the cave. Now, it may have been noisy out there with 3,000 men. I'm sure they weren't that quiet. Maybe that's uh, the atmosphere that's going on. It could have been, you know, it could have been that Saul just wasn't paying attention. But anyway, he didn't see any of those guys, had no idea that they were there. None at all. And verse 4 says, you know, as the men said to him, this is the day which the Lord said to you. Well, we don't know when the Lord said that, but the Lord had said to David, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. But you know, here's the thing with David. He didn't look at Saul as his enemy. And even though his men said that to him, and even though the opportunity, there it is, you can solve all your problems. Just go in, just go over. He doesn't even hear him come over. David goes over, no, go over and, and kill him. But he didn't, you know. Uh, he didn't do that. Verse 4, the men said that. Then verse 5, it happened afterward. Well, wait a minute. Let me start, let me start right at 4 again. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. So the opportunity presented itself. And I'm sure, I know if I were David, my first thought is, here he is. He's been tormenting me. He's got me on the run. I can't live a normal life anymore. I've gone from such great blessing to this difficulty, and I've got a knife in my hand. I can fix it. I can solve this. But that wasn't David's heart. That's my heart. That's what I would do. I'm going to take matters in my own hand. But instead, you know, even with the urging of his men, instead, David goes, no, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. This is God's problem. David said, no, I'm not going to do it. And even going over and cutting the corner of Saul's robe, that, just doing that little thing, afflicted David's conscience. How sensitive he was to right and wrong. You know, what a sensitive conscience he had. He certainly couldn't kill him. He probably was tempted. Um, but even in that, though he may have been tempted, you know, uh, maybe. But if God promises us something, we're not justified in sinning to pursue it. And that's the point with David. He said, no, I'm not going to do wrong so that I can accomplish. God made a promise to David. You remember, he anointed. He was anointed by Samuel. You will be king. Here's the king. You know, he's got a perfect opportunity to, to get rid of him. But David chooses rather to allow the Lord to take care of that. If God promised it, God can perform it. And he's going to trust in the Lord and not uh, do, do it in his own strength. Do it by sin. You know, and, and so, you know, what he said to his men as well. You know, he, he could have backed away and said, hey, look, you guys, you go ahead. If you kill him, I can't stop you. You know, he could have allowed that. His men were more, more than willing. But instead, no, not only did David not kill him. He restrained his men. You know, verse 6, The Lord forbid that I should do this to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. They, they had him there. They just let him go. You know, he didn't store up bitterness. He didn't store up anger against Saul. When you think of all the trials that David is going through, and yet, he was just trusting the Lord and all that. That's, that's astounding to me. 
That's why scripture calls him a man after God's own heart. You know, he's trusted. It's amazing to me. Now, he did cut his robe. He cut Saul's robe. And that, uh, that robe symbolizes the authority that Saul had. I mean, that's what identified him as the king. But he was troubled. David's troubled at marring this symbol of God's anointed leader. And uh, I, I just have this quote here I want to read. Because it convicted me and I want to convict you. So there, that's, that's the way it works, right? I copy these things down. I share them when they trouble me. But uh, Meyer is the name. I don't know his first name. I don't know who he is. But he said this. It was a trifling matter. And yet it seemed dishonoring to God's anointed king. And as such, it hurt David to have done it. We sometimes in conversation and criticism cut off a piece of a man's character or influence for good or standing in the esteem of others. Doesn't that convict you? <laughs> How easily our words can do that. And he says this, he goes on to say, Ought not our hearts smite us for such thoughtless conduct? Ought we not to make confession and reparation? Yep. You know, it, it's so easy to just, you know, he didn't kill David. I mean, he didn't kill Saul, but he, just that little marring of this symbol of his authority, of Saul's authority, troubled David. And we need to be careful, you know, and that, that's why this was so, uh, it's so easy for me to say things and then regret what I have said, you know. Don't you hate that? Cut off a piece of a man's character or influence for good or standing in the esteem of others. You know, we don't need to tear people down. In fact, we're encouraged by Scripture that the reason we have this mouth and that tongue in there is to build people up, to edify and to encourage. And that's what we should be doing. <clears throat> and so David, in his humble and tender conscience that he had before God, that prevented his men from doing evil to Saul. So he didn't do it. He restrained himself and restrained his men. So verse 8 says, So David also arose afterward, went out of the cave, and called out to Saul, saying, My lord the king. And Saul looked behind him. David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. Now just imagine that presentation that David has. In humility, to confront the one who is pursuing him. Now that's, that's, uh, that's a little bit crazy, really. It's a huge risk that David is taking. Because like I said, he's way outnumbered, five to one odds. There's a big army out there and Saul's there. And he goes out to confront him, to say to him, um, in humility, to reveal himself, and to reveal his heart to Saul, he goes out and says this to him, verse 9, And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm? Now David knows that Saul was not listening to counselors. David knows the issue is with Saul himself. But you know, this is a good way to smooth things over, gloss it over, to say, look, Saul, you know, respecting who he is, look, I know that maybe you don't, you're, you know, you're doing this because you're listening to counsel that is wrong. You don't need to listen to that, you know. So David's just trying to not blame him. That's the thing. Just to say it's circumstances or, or the words of man who say, indeed, David seeks your harm. But verse 10, he says, look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eye spared you. See, he's saying, if I had listened to my men, my counselors, I could have gone and killed you. So don't listen to your men. Don't come and kill me. That's really what David's saying here. They, someone urged me to kill you, but my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, my father, you know, the humility in his voice, 
But in a sense, he really is, because Saul is his father-in-law. That's not an inappropriate way to address him, my father. Moreover, my father, verse 11, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. And after whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A flea? Therefore let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. So David, in humility, not in anger, not in bitterness, not in wrath of any sort, he confronts Saul. In boldness but humility, what a great mixture that is. To go out and say, I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to harm you. I'm not going to hurt you. And you know, the thing that the Lord was speaking to my heart about this last night, overnight, is just the reality of because of this virus, we're all in a cave. And there's a point, there's a time where we have to come out of the cave and we have to confront the leaders of our nation and let them know, look, I'm sorry, but this is what the Lord wants done. We have to obey God rather than man. And and I'm grateful that my pastor, that Ken has, has done that, that he has taken a stand. He's come out of the cave, not because he wants to undermine the authority of the government. There is no way that that's the, the matter at all. But it's just to inform those who are in leadership of our state and of our nation, that we have a responsibility to gather in the presence of Almighty God and to, to use the gifts that God has given us as a body, one with another, to encourage one another, to build one another up. You know, the we're called to do, um, well, Ephesians 4. What does it tell us to do? I think I'm going to go there and just read it because I... I like to do it that way, then it's right from the book. But you know, as far as the responsibility of the pastor, in Ephesians 4, in verse 11, it says, For he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So the the ministry to the church. And what is the ministry that we have? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So it's equipping and it's edifying till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I don't think we've made that yet. I don't think we're there yet. And so I don't think that the ministry should be ended yet. You know, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why we gather. It's that purpose there that we together, each one doing its part, can grow in our knowledge of who Jesus is and in representing Jesus to a lost and dying world. And, and there's that point where, yes, we go in the cave, but there's a point where we have to come out of the cave. Now, in David coming out of the cave... Was it risk-free? No, absolutely not. There's 3,000 soldiers there, and Saul, who wants to put a knife in him. But he stepped out anyway to confront it, to make a statement that this is not the will of the Lord. And I think that's what my pastor is doing as well. He's just making that statement. 
that the body of Christ needs to gather. We need to be together. We need to encourage one another. And we just can't do that this way always. Now, for us here in Cherryfield, at Church of the Open Bible, we've got, what, three weeks, I think, when we probably can gather, and yet there is some information out there that's not been determined that it may be not based on 50 or less people, but a percentage based on the size of your church. So it could be that maybe we could only have church for, for five or 10 or 20 come June 7th. Well, you know, we can't do that. That's just the bottom line. We need to be together. We need, so pray about that. You know, I, I just think that's, uh, it's time. It's time to come out of the cave. It's time to confront, not angrily, not rebelliously, not with any kind of animus at all, but just to confront the reality that the Lord God has called us to gather as a church. The Lord God has called us to be united together as one. You know, as it says in Hebrews, that we, with, well, that's another good place. Let's go there, Hebrews chapter 10. It's in my head, I might as well get it out of my mouth, I guess, but I don't want to quote it wrong. I should commit more to scripture to memory, I guess, but another purpose, you know, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. How do we do that if we're not together? How can we stir up love by email, text message? That just doesn't work the same. It's something about being face to face. It's something about us being involved in each other's lives that allows us to do that. And then you get to verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, guess what? I see the day approaching real fast. The day of the Lord, when you look at what's going on in the world right now and our quick headlong push into socialism in our nation, the day is coming. Things are changing. Things are changing rapidly. And we as a church need to be together. We need to encourage one another. We need to stir up one another. And we need to be busy about the work of the Lord. And so not to be an offense to anyone, but certainly not to be an offense to the Lord either. We need to obey God. We need to do as he leads us. Come out of the cave. There's, there's certainly, a, uh, you know, there are those who should be concerned. I'm concerned. I'm of the age and I have the comorbidities. I have asthma. I shouldn't be getting this virus. And yet I'm not going to be crazy about it either. I'm going to be cautious and I'm going to be obedient to what God calls me to do. And that's what you need to do. If the Lord is saying, no, I don't want to go and meet with anyone, that's fine. But um, I just don't have that same conviction. I, I have such peace. I was in a meeting with 20 men last night, a prayer meeting for a couple hours. It was awesome. We're all fine. We were all fine two weeks ago when there was 30 or 40 of us that got together and prayed. We can do these things. It's okay. God is with us. And I just, I got to trust with the Lord. I want to be like David. Just trust the Lord, uh, have hand sanitizer. It, it, you know, it's okay to wear a mask, that'd be fine. It's okay to stay home. It's okay to do any of those things. We'll continue to broadcast live, but I'm not gonna live in fear either. We have to confront at times the authority. And that's what David has done here. He's gone out and he's confronted the authority of his nation. That's who Saul is. He's confronted them not to in any way undermine his authority, but just to tell him, you, you're doing wrong. You've gone too far. You know, I'm blessed that the town of Callis has just said every business is essential, open for business. Um, my son checked with the mayor. That does mean the church, because it didn't say so in any of the reporting on it. So we just wanted to verify, yep, open the church. So. Uh, they're going to do that, uh, as far as I know. 
Praise the Lord. That's a good thing. And I was in that meeting, as I said, with 15 other pastors last night. Almost all of them are having in-person services right now. There's a number of other churches all over the country. It's okay. It really is okay. You know, and now that doesn't mean that I could not have someone come in if we did that and arrest me. That could happen. I'm going to obey God, though. And I'm not going to fight them if they come. I'll go with them. They'll be all right. But at some point, we just need to gather. That's what we need to do. And we need to worship. And we need to praise the God who has done so much for us. Now, I wonder what Saul thought, you know, as David comes out. Just think of that, you know, the response <laughs> when he hears this. You know, moreover, my father, you see the corner of your robe cut. You see that it's in my hand. You know, you think about that. Where did that go in Saul's head? You know, where did he think about that? Remember back, where was it? Uh, 1 Samuel 15, just back a few pages. When he's supposed to go and he's supposed to uh, destroy all the Amalekites, and Samuel comes to him and says, hey, how come you didn't do what God said? And he's letting... Saul know there, Samuel is, that the Lord has rejected him. In verse 27 of 1 Samuel 15, it says, And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. I wonder if that was a flashback for Saul. Wow. Remember? Because what did Samuel say there? Verse 28, So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you i'm sure you know robe for robe i'm sure that was one of the first maybe not the first thing the first thing was this david i'm going to get him but then there's that piece of robe in david's hand and that flashback that had to be there you know many have used this though as well this you know, that you should not touch the Lord's anointed. And for that reason, it's been used to insulate religious leaders many times. That's not what this is about at all. Uh, many would say you should never give criticism or rebuke to a pastor. That's just not true. We all need to be held accountable. What it's saying here about he won't touch the Lord's anointed is he won't kill him. Don't kill me. I don't want to be killed. That's okay. You don't have to kill me. But you certainly can confront me if you disagree on anything I ever say. I don't mind that. I appreciate it, in fact. And I actually have done that myself in times past. You know what? It's okay. You know, you get through that. But, it, you know, we're, we're men. We're human. And we make mistakes. And there are errors. And usually the guy who will say, touch not the Lord's anointed, is the guy that needs to be touched. <laughs> you know, isn't that true? You know, it just seems that way. But anyway, verse 12, as we read, you know, let the Lord judge between you and me and let the Lord avenge me on you. David saying, I'm not going to take vengeance myself, but my hand shall not be against you because wickedness proceeds from the wicked. You know, he said, my heart is not wicked. I'm not, you know, God, God knows that I am for you, Saul. My hand shall not, he says again, my hand shall not be against you. I will not. He reassures Saul that he has no need to fear from him. However, Saul may need to fear from the Lord. I mean, he didn't, he's saying, let the Lord judge you. The Lord will deal with you. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to in any way cause your demise, Saul, but there is a God in heaven. and He is aware of the affairs of men. And I'm just going to let the Lord deal with you. That should be a scary statement to him. That should have really affected Saul greatly. And, you know, we see in the response, well, before we go there, just thinking, what if David had killed Saul? You know, what would happen then? You think about the scenario. He had the opportunity, but there's 3,000 men outside there. Where's Saul? He's not coming out. When's he coming out? You know, and, and then, I mean, David can't just sneak out of the cave. Those guys are all there waiting for Saul. You know, there would have been a battle. And maybe David would have been killed as well. 
But even if he escaped, here are all these men. Would they have followed him or would they not? Were they loyal to Saul? I mean, you just see how it was a setup to cause division. And so when David does come, and David is ruler of the land, there isn't any of that division. There's a unity. And the men who were with Saul saw the character of David. And how do you think that spoke to them? How do you think they responded after that? When David was king, they were excited to have him as their king. See what a setup it was if David had done that? How difficult that would have been. But David didn't do that. And now verse 16, we get Saul's reaction. It says, so it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, that Saul said, is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Then he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And so Saul just starts bawling, just starts weeping, his reaction. He responds with emotion because he really thought that David would want to kill him. And think of the conviction when he didn't. Here I am doing everything I can to kill this man, and he has a chance to kill me. Put an end to all of it, and he let me go. Wow. That should be, that should have changed everything. I mean, that's how I, I look at the Lord. I mean, I've done everything against him, and yet he continues to love me. He continues to be for me. He's not going to hold anything against me. He's promised to cast my sin as into the sea of his forgetfulness. He looks at me as if I were Jesus. Think of that. That's what God does. What an amazing God. So anyway, he responds with emotion. And this should be true repentance, but it isn't. We know as we read the rest, he comes back again and again. This is a, a temporary remorse. You know, David, he rewarded evil with good. That's what it tells us to do in Romans 12, 21. You know, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's what David has done here. What a, what a great example. And so David's desire, I think, in revealing himself has been accomplished. He wanted Saul to understand that he has nothing against him. And Saul is broken, and he's very sorry, you know. And he goes on in verse 20, he says, And now I know indeed that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. He could see that. And he knew it anyway, but he knows for sure now. Uh, verse 21, Therefore swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me, and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. So David swore to Saul, and Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. You know, you think about it, of course. You know, I mean, David's best buddy is Jonathan. He's not going to kill him. He's married to Saul's daughter, Michael. You know, I mean, I love your family. That's what he's saying. You know, I look at you as my dad. He called him father as well. No, I wouldn't do that. But what it reveals is what was in Saul's heart. If the tables were turned, when David died, Saul would have wiped out his family. He would have done that. But that's not at all in David's heart. He had no appetite to destroy this family that meant so much to him. So David doesn't return with Saul. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? You would think, okay, this would have patched everything up. But David understands, you know, just what John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 3, you know, in confronting the Pharisees, he said, what are you guys doing here? I'll paraphrase. What are you guys doing here? You have nothing to do with the things of God. But then he goes on and says, 
If you're repentant, bring forth fruits of your repentance. Show me that you're repentant. I will know that by what you do. And that's the thing here. Repentance and a changed heart are not validated by the emotion of the moment. They're not. You know, it takes time. You've got to see, has his heart really changed? And sadly, with Saul, it didn't. Alan Redpath, this is another quote from a commentary that I looked at. He said, what a miserable picture Saul is. What is the use of saying, I have played the fool, if he goes on playing the fool? What use are his tears and confession before David if he doesn't act out his remorse? If a man is emotionally upset, as Saul was, and awakens to his condition, but only weeps about it and still doesn't obey God, his second state is a thousand times worse than the first. Emotion that does not lead to action only leads deeper into sin and rebellion. Quite a statement, isn't it? It's true. It doesn't ring true? Remorse, the difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse is saying, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry that I was caught because it hurts me. That's what remorse is. I'm sorry. See that a lot in kids. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why are you sorry? Because I'm about to get my backside walloped and I'm going to be sent to bed. So, yeah, I'm really sorry. But if I could have got away with it, I wasn't sorry at all, you know. So that's remorse. And that's what Saul had. He was confronted with something that made him remorseful. But true repentance is sorry for what I did and sorry because it hurt God, ultimately. Every sin is against God. And so the reaction to it is, I've got to change. I can't do this again. That's what true repentance is. It's a change of heart, change of direction. Saul did not have that. And Saul will not have that. It's tragic. His life is a tragic. He started so well, but he finishes so bad. Well, that's, uh, that's chapter 24. So much there. Um. It's okay to stay in the cave if you need to. I'm not staying in the cave. I'm out of the cave. I'm here at church now every week. <laughs> Praise be to God. So uh, do as the Lord leads you, though. That's what we all have to do is be obedient to the Lord. Well, let's pray. Let's close in prayer. And thank you for joining us this morning. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful day once again. Thank you for your word, though. It just speaks to our heart. It reveals to us, Lord, we want to be like David because David is like you. We want to have his boldness and yet his humility. We want to have his compassion and yet his strength. So, Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would further equip us to do your will. That you would allow us, Lord, to hear your voice and give us the strength to follow where you lead. We thank you, Lord this time, I ask you to bless the rest of our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Lord bless you. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning, if you can, 1030. It's about 15 minutes long. And otherwise, be right here again next Sunday. Lord willing. God bless you.